429 ready. Give us that same introduction. And that is a little high. Verse 1, ready to suffer grief or pain, ready to stand the test, ready to stay at our stand. Others, if he sees, I'll get best. Ready to go, ready to stay, ready my place to fill, ready for service, lowly or great, ready to do his will. <clears throat> Now you know why football players, if they change centers, have to practice the handoff. Because it's the same plays, but the timing's got to be just right, doesn't it? And I'm figuring out where you're at now. Let's try verse 2. Are you ready? I'm ready. Ready to go, ready to bear, ready to watch and pray, ready to stand aside and give, Till he shall clear the way, good. Ready to go, ready to stay. Ready my place to fill. Ready for service, lowly or great. Ready to do his will. You had it right, Ella. I didn't on holding that note extra, another beat. Verse number four. Ready to speak, ready to warn. Ready our souls to yearn. Ready in life or ready in death. Ready for his return. Ready to go, ready to stay. Ready my place to fill. Ready for service, lowly or great. Ready to do his will. Did we, ha well, let's have a word of prayer. And I don't know if we had another one. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come for a second service. Bless our missionaries. Pray that you will bless the church as we look forward to uh, the week before us, if it be thy will, for Bible studies and school and work and all that takes place. Bless the Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm glad to have you here. Our panis is cut out on us. I have an offering and a, and a gift form for our missionaries, but they're not here. But maybe he preached long over at Liberty Baptist Church. We tried to figure it out. We have a check for $125 for travel expense. They'll be heading to Summersville tonight to minister in a church. And we have $50 in cash for, um, huh, is that enough to feed a family of eight anymore? Depends where would you have to go to do that. Uh, popcorn and drinks at Kroger's maybe. Huh. I don't know, gourmet popcorn is too high too, isn't it? Wednesday night, be back on the Bible study uh, of the great questions in the scriptures. And we've got more, fig got more written out. There's a lot more than even I knew that I said, I didn't know he asked that as a question. Anything else? Anybody like to give a word of testimony? Can I ask questions to anybody I want to? I won't do that until that door opens. See, I didn't embarrass Claire, so I'm going to talk to Ethan. Ethan, how you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Would you please? Yeah. Thanks, partner. You didn't wear anything with a, a Bruin on it today. No, I did not. Okay. Hey, hey Matt, uh, Matt did.
Thank you, partner. Uh, do you all know what Ethan's going to be doing this summer? All the years we've gone to the wilds for camp, Ethan's going to be one of the team leaders. And I think you're going to need an extra dose of energy. And I, I don't know how those fellows do it. Uh, they got to keep all those counselors and young people enthused, enthused and fired up for the week. And um, I'm just going to tell you right now, I've already written down and will present the church. We'll try and support you this summer, okay? Anybody can put that kind of effort and come and see our young people. We can help out. Brother, Brother Childers, you're going to have to introduce this, this group with you, okay? I'm, I, I'm confident when you candidated here, how many, many years ago, I think you had two kids, yeah. probably. And uh, we looked and saw some advertisements from Italy that if you move over there and bring kids with you, you know, they will pay you to come, you know, stuff like that. So uh, we've been thinking about this, you know. Uh, but you're going to have to, if you don't mind, Paul, you're going to have to introduce all the family, okay? And uh, take a few minutes here for the folks that stay and share with us what you're doing, what you, what the Lord's laid on your heart for a few minutes here. It's great to be with you guys today. I apologize for coming in late. I don't know if uh, Pastor Setzer explained, but we were at another church over in Princeton that just did, we just did finish up there and just did get over here. Uh, I know that wasn't ideal, but uh, I appreciate you all letting us come anyway and come in a little bit late. It helps us out a lot. We've got, uh, we're going to be here in the States for three months and we've got more churches to visit than we can visit in three months. So uh, being here with you guys right now has been a, is a real blessing for us and I thank you for that. Uh, to answer your pastor's question, uh, we started raising support 20 years ago uh, to go to Italy, and your all's church was one of the very first to take us on. And so it's been 20 years that you guys have been helping us in our effort to get the gospel message to the people of Italy, and we appreciate it. One of the, I like, uh, we come here for several reasons, you know, a furlough and presenting the ministry to the church is primarily about accountability and letting you guys know uh, what we've been doing, uh, what's, where your investment is going, and we certainly pray that you're getting lots of fruit uh, for your effort in that. We believe that everything that we do in Italy is an extension of your own ministry here, and all of the fruit that we have there is your all's fruit. And so uh, we thank you for that. I'm going to let you know how that's going here in a little bit. But another reason that I want to be here today is just to express our gratitude to you because it literally is not possible for us to live and do the work that we do without you all. And so we appreciate you and we thank the Lord for you and we thank you for your support of our ministry there. Now, we got started uh, in Italy. We were last here in your church, I believe, eight years ago in 2016, so it's been a little while. I'll give you kind of a brief update of what we did because we reported back to you sometime before, uh, up to 2016, so you should uh, possibly know uh, uh, somewhat about our ministry up to that point, but I'll catch up a little bit if you've forgotten. We started, we got to Italy in o October of 2006, so we've been there 18 years, and we started working with veteran missionaries who had been there about 20 years when we got there. They opened up their ministry to us and allowed us to uh, be with them while we were in language school and allowed us to get involved in the ministry little bits at a time as we were capable linguistically. During that time, we met another family who had just gotten to Italy the same time we did, the Maeta family. They were going to start a church in the city of Grosseto. They invited us to come and uh, assist them in that work, and we told them that we would go there. We went there in 2009 and started working together with them, and that's where we've been ever since, in the city of Grosseto. Now, the main thrust of our ministry, our main responsibilities are with children, youth, evangelistic outreach, one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, and all special events in the church. We do a lot of things like uh, couples banquets and different things that we plan, you know, uh, sometimes for evangelism, sometimes for edification and encouragement, but uh, we plan all of those things. We do a lot. Uh, one of the most important things, I would say, for many years was probably the highlight 
of our ministry. We started in 2010 an evangelistic meeting in the month of December that we hold in connection with uh, a children's Christmas program where we invite an, an American evangelist to come in and preach the gospel for several days and then we end that meeting with our children's Christmas program. We typically have a lot of people that come to that. We've had over 100 people attend that meeting and that's where we've seen the bulk of our uh, uh, fruit but most of people who have come to the Lord through our ministry have come through that evangelistic meeting. That's where we've seen the most salvations. Now, we do a lot of things. We do track distribution. Uh, we do open-air markets, distributing in uh, tracks and other evangelistic materials in open-air markets. We do our vacation Bible school. A lot of those things, our children's activities and things, are typically evangelistic. And uh, But where we've seen the most fruit is through that evangelistic meeting. Because of that, three years ago, we added a second evangelistic meeting in the summertime, and we also hold that. We found that the children's ministry has been the best way to get adults into the church as well. So that works that way with our Christmas program. And so we uh, combine now our vacation Bible school also with an evangelistic meeting. So we hold our, uh, our vacation Bible school in the afternoon, uh, typically ends up around 7 o'clock, we're done, and we go straight from that into an evangelistic meeting in the evening, the hope being that a lot of the parents who brought their kids to the vacation Bible school stick around and stay for the evangelistic meeting afterwards. And we've been doing that now for three years, and we've been seeing a good deal of fruit from that. I had mentioned earlier that the highlight of our ministry for many years was that evangelistic meeting that we hold in December. Now probably the highlight, the biggest uh, evangelistic outreach that we do now is that uh, vacation Bible school and evangelistic meeting together and uh, the Lord has been blessing that we see have seen uh, a certain amount of fruit from that so we praise the Lord we don't see in Italy it's a very difficult place we don't see huge numbers of people coming to Christ all the time but we have seen steady growth all through the years we've had to expand our building on several occasions we started renting a small storefront building in uh, 2008 and in 2014 we purchased one right next to it and combined the two and purchased the one that we had been renting uh, this, just last year we purchased a third one uh, along beside the second one we had purchased and combined them all together and now uh, the Lord has blessed us with that we needed that space for lots of things uh, because the Lord has been blessing the ministry so we thank the Lord for that uh, along the lines of evangelism what we ask people to pray for is for the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the people we've been asking for that for 20 years and that's the same thing we're asking for today that's what we need when people ask us about the greatest challenge of reaching Italians with the gospel I respond typically the greatest challenge is indifference on the part of the people to uh, to the gospel you would be surprised to know that uh, at least I'm surprised I always thought going to Italy you'd be dealing with lots of Catholics and 90% of the people call themselves Catholics. I always figured I'd be talking with people who wanted to talk about God and the Bible and Jesus and we would uh, be debating whether it's by faith in Christ alone or by faith in Christ plus the church plus all of the works that are tacked on to faith in Christ in the Catholic way of seeing things. But that's not the case. Most of the people that we talk to are agnostic or atheist and simply are not interested in having conversations about the gospel they're indifferent to it and so we need the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the people um, I this is a very strange thing uh, but I've actually talked to people there who, who have told me that they're Catholic atheists if you can imagine that uh, I can't imagine that existing but apparently it does because I've been told by people that's what they are Catholic atheists so they don't want to know about God. They don't know, want to talk about Jesus Christ. We're not having conversations very frequently at all with Catholic people about the difference in uh, a Baptist and a Catholic. Very rarely do we have those conversations. Most of the time people just don't want to talk at all. So uh, I ask that you pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the people. Now one of the real big uh, burdens that we have and the real thrust of our ministry is to st establish new churches and we go about that in several different ways we've been able to uh, start new churches and assist others in starting new churches in a couple of ways one thing we do there's a real need in Italy for uh, places where incoming missionaries can come and get started like we did it's not easy to find a veteran missionary who will let you come in and be a part of his ministry uh, until you get your feet on the ground and are able to minister linguistically to the people. So we have done that. We have opened the doors of our church and told incoming missionaries that they are welcome to uh, spend 
a year and a half to two years is typically about what it takes to learn the language and get to where you can minister. Um, and we allow people to come in and use our place to do that, to get experience, to learn the language, and then we help them start new churches when they're ready to go out and do that on their own. We were able to do that from 2014 to 2016. We had a family that lived with us in our town and ministered in our church uh, for two years, and then they went up to Pisa. We helped them get a church started up there. It's just about an hour and a half north of us, and that church is thriving today. Uh, it uh, made the process of starting that church for them a lot easier, having us right there beside them, supporting them in that effort. We had materials ready for them to go, and we're able to assist them all the way through, even up till today. We're still able to collaborate with them a lot and assist them in that new church up there. So we praise God for that opportunity. Just last year, um, one, of the, one of the unique things about uh, independent Baptist missionary work in Italy is that uh, up until one year ago, there was not a single fundamental Baptist church in Italy being pastored by an Italian man, and that's a real problem. Uh, last year that changed, and we were able to be involved in the establishment of a new church in a town about seven hours south of us, the town of Foggia. We did not train this particular pastor. Another ministry trained him, but we were able to assist them in the establishment of a new church in that town. Uh, as I preached an evangelistic meeting for them, our church went down and helped dis, uh, distribute John and Romans for them in the days leading up to their very first church service. We distributed about 30,000 John and Romans in three days, and then uh, I preached the gospel for a couple of days in advance of their opening service. And so we praise the Lord that today, one year later, they just celebrated their one-year anniversary last month. Uh, there is a, a church being pastored, an independent fundamental Baptist church being pastored by an Italian man. We were able to assist another situation in a church about four hours north of us. There was not a church there. There was an American man who had lived with his family in Italy uh, not ministering. They're not missionaries. Uh, this man was working in the private sector uh, in Italy and had been praying for many, many years that the Lord would send a missionary to his area to start a new church. And after many years of praying and nobody ever came, he finally decided that the Lord was leading him to become a pastor. And he was a man who had studied over the years and was pretty well prepared, but he was not a pastor. He had not been ordained. Uh, together with another church, an American military church, where uh, close to where he lived, about an hour's drive from him, which would actually be his uh, where his membership is, we were able to ordain him as a pastor. I was involved in that ordination service. We preached that, and now there's a new church. They started a brand new church. This was just about six months ago. Uh, they're about four hours north of us, and we praise the Lord that we're able to be involved in that to a certain degree, and that there's another church uh, that has opened its doors there that's preaching and reaching, uh, preaching the gospel and reaching Italian people. So we're doing a lot of things to try to see new churches get started. The real problem in starting new churches is that a, a new church needs a pastor, right? So if you don't have a pastor, you don't have a church. If you don't have somebody who's preaching the gospel and uh, reaching out to the community, you, don't act, you can't really have a church. You can have that temporarily if you've already got a group of people. But where you have nothing, where you have nothing, no man working and no people meeting, you don't have a church, so we need men uh, to be pastors. We ask you to pray about that on two levels. First off, we ask that you pray that the Lord would raise up Italian men who could be pastors of new churches. So we have one young man in our church who's a good prospect. We don't know that uh, the Lord will lead him to be a pastor, but we're working with him. We're training him. Uh, we have an older man in our church that we've been working with for about 10 years who is a great preacher. He preaches for us a lot in our church. He preaches out in other churches around uh, neither of these men are pastors right now, but we pray that one day that could that situation could develop because that's what we need. Another thing that we're doing, and this is uh, a huge burden that we have in our church and our ministry, is since there is such a huge need, there's only about mm, 12 or maybe 15 uh, fundamental Baptist churches in all of Italy that are reaching Italian people. So there aren't very many American missionaries there either who are preaching the gospel. So we pray about that, that the Lord provide new American missionaries, and we're trying to do our part to, to cause that to happen, to, to foster that. We have opened up our ministry as a place where especially young men who feel like the Lord is leading them into the ministry and probably more specifically to be a missionary, to come and spend uh, a significant amount of time with us with the hopes that those uh, young men would come back as missionaries to the people of Italy. We've been doing that for seven years now, and we have uh, one young man in particular who spent a summer with us who is currently raising support to go to Italy 
and be a missionary there. So we praise the Lord for that. We have another young man who has said that he feels that the Lord ha would have him to go back to Italy. He has not started the process yet, uh, but hopefully he will soon. And uh, just this past summer, this is something that uh, we're really ramping up uh, the more we do it. This past summer we had three or four people spend significant time with us, young people who are actively praying about coming back to Italy to preach the gospel there and be missionaries there. This coming summer, we have one lined up already and possibly as many as three that could be spending the summer with us next summer. And we have two college groups who are going to be coming through our ministry next year. And our prayer is, our hope and prayer is that as these people come through, they'll get a burden to stay and be missionaries to the people of Italy. So if you could help us pray about those things, that's... Um, we need more laborers, and that's a real emphasis in our ministry is to recruit people to come to Italy. I will tell you this along these lines. If there's anybody in this church who feels like the Lord is leading them into the ministry and possibly specifically into the mission field, we would encourage you to come and spend time with us. We would like to recruit you to come to Italy, so uh, be in prayer about that. We uh, happily invite the churches to bring their youth group to us to do a mission trip or something like that to and again we're trying to foster that to where people will come back to Italy we're trying to recruit people to come there so feel free to come if you come you need to know that we'll be putting pressure on you to stay but uh, that's all right that's kind of what we do uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about and um, ask you to pray about is a few years back the Lord blessed our family with some land. We uh, purchased 20 acres, and that was something that we did just for ourselves as a family um, because we got a lot of kids, and they need a lot of room. Uh, this isn't all of our kids. We have 10. We have two that came back to the States last year. They're in Bible college down in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then we have our third daughter. Uh, she's not here right now. She's still in Italy. Uh, she's taking care of our farm, which I'm about to tell you about. Uh, so we have seven here today, and uh, we praise the Lord for them. I reckon we had one, maybe two, uh, 20 years ago. Anyway... Uh, through purchasing this farm, uh, the Lord began to lay on our hearts the idea of using it as a camp ministry to start a camp ministry where we would use the land that the Lord blessed us with to uh, reach out to people for evangelism, also for encouragement and edification. We've already been doing it to a certain degree. We've had, uh, we typically always hold our youth activities out there with our teenagers. We have held our, v our vacation Bible school out there for our young children and, um, the church up in Pisa will typically come down about once a summer and spend a day with us and do farm activities. We do uh, lots of stuff, but the Lord has been burdening us now for several years, probably about three years, to start a full-blown camp ministry there uh, on our land, and we anticipate starting that uh, officially this summer, uh, the summer of 2005. Probably this summer. We don't know uh, how big it's going to be, but we anticipate having a week of day camp for children and a week of day camp for uh, teenagers. We will, uh, in there as well, probably be running a, an English camp. For many years now, we've been teaching English because there's a lot of demand, uh, especially for young children, to learn English as a second language. So we have all kinds of people. At uh, one point, we had 30 to 50 people coming through our home every week to learn English, and those are we do that because that, those, that's where we get contacts with people. That's how we are able to have meaningful conversations with people about the gospel because they're in our home for English, and then we uh, give them the gospel. So we will probably run some English camps on our farm that might finance to a certain degree the church camps then that we would do. We don't know what all we're going to do, but we do ask you to pray for us about that. There's a lot of work that goes into that. It's not an easy thing to do, uh, but it's, uh, we feel the Lord has laid it on our hearts to do it, and so we're going to do it. And uh, we have to develop our land for that. It's not completely ready right now to host people uh, all day long, you know, uh, five, six days in a row. So we have a lot of work that we have to do to develop that, and so I'd ask that you'd help us pray about those things. So uh, just to, to sum it up and to remind you, please pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the people. Pray for uh, new laborers, first off Italian men who could be pastors of new churches, and for new American missionaries, and we're doing all that we can to encourage that and to, you know, to try to make that happen. Obviously, it's the Lord who does the calling, but we're there to prepare and help and encourage that all that we can, and then help us pray about this new camp ministry that we're wanting to start up this coming summer. I ask my family to come up here now, and uh, we'll sing a song for you.
Okay, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We'll read to the end of the passage. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised, up, uh, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we have today to be together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're here, Father, because of our common faith in Jesus Christ. And we're here because of our love for you. And we're here because of our, our desire to know you better through your word. And so I pray that through the preaching of your word, you'd help us to know you better and help us to draw close to you through what we learn here today. And I pray that you would give us the grace to put into practice the things that we learn from your word. I thank you, Father, for this church and for their faithfulness to help us, for their faithfulness to you. I pray, Father, that they would see fruit for their labor. I pray these things in Jesus' name. I pray it for the honor and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what we have here is the beginning of the Christmas story. and We think about Christmas as a, a very wonderful time in our culture. Uh, Christmas is perhaps uh, many people's favorite time of year. And just reading passages, verses like this regarding these things, uh, it's quite possible that your mind uh, was flooded with warm thoughts of Christmases that you've enjoyed, and it's a very heartwarming thing Christmas is. Uh, for us, Christmas uh, is, in, in this text, it's about Joseph and Mary doing their part to bring Jesus Christ into the world and that's what I want us to think about this morning is bringing Jesus Christ into the world and I believe that bringing Jesus Christ into the world is a wonderful thing I believe it's uh, often we missionaries uh, present it and not only missionaries but pastors and evangelists present it as uh, a, a glorious thing and a majestic thing and almost a romantic type thing you know uh, we talk about the highlights of the ministry and we talk about how wonderful it is and we talk about people coming to Christ and lives being changed and it truly is a wonderful thing it's a glorious thing it's a majestic thing bringing Jesus Christ into the world and being dedicated as an individual and as a church to doing all you can to bringing Jesus Christ into the world I think it's uh, the the greatest thing that we can be doing we'll talk a little bit about that later but I want to look uh, for just a little bit at just how that was for Joseph we go back to verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, his mo when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child. Now that's a big problem. Before they came together, she was found with child. And Joseph finds himself, if we were to describe it, uh, we wouldn't use any pretty adjectives to describe it. Uh, I would describe his situation as a mess. There's nothing glorious or majestic about bringing Jesus Christ into the world from Joseph's perspective in verse 18 and verse 19 right now. Now that's humanly speaking. We didn't read the last little phrase there. It says, of the Holy Ghost. But now Joseph didn't know that at this point. He had limited knowledge about what he was going through at the time. But what he was going through was bringing Jesus Christ into the world, and there was nothing beautiful about it. There was nothing romantic about it. In fact, he's pretty confused about the whole thing. He doesn't know exactly what's going on, but again, uh, his limited human knowledge, he probably believes, more than likely, he could only believe one thing, and that's that Mary had been unfaithful to him. That's about the only thing he could imagine, because he doesn't know 
yet that this is of the Holy Ghost. He hasn't understood that. He hasn't had that kind of enlightenment yet. And what Joseph is in right here really is a mess. Here he's being called upon to bring Jesus Christ into the world, and he's really confused about the whole thing. He doesn't know what to do about it. He's got several options. He could, I suppose, go forward as though nothing uh, uh, in particular out of the ordinary were going on. He could try to hide Mary away down here. If you read verse 19, uh, you know, maybe he could put her away to, to the side, kind of try to hide her for a while until she had the baby and then see what happened. Maybe nobody would ever find out about it. He could maybe not go forward at all. Maybe he could just not marry her as he probably could have, would have been within his rights to do such a thing. But one thing's for certain. Uh, there's nothing pleasant about the situation that Joseph finds himself in and being called upon to bring Jesus Christ into the world. I think uh, if you, if this church has ever done anything to try to bring Jesus Christ into the world, you've probably had a similar experience. I can tell you that bringing Jesus Christ into the world, though we talk about it as a glorious and majestic thing and we romanticize it, to a certain degree, most of the time when you're in it and when you're planning it, before it happens, you've decided you're going to do something to bring Jesus Christ into the world, and there's always a cost to pay. There's always something uncomfortable about bringing Jesus Christ into the world. It's typically going to cost something, maybe financially. If it's going to be uh, supporting another missionary, that's typically a financial cost. If you've decided that you as an individual are going to do all that you can to preach the gospel to the people around you often, that comes at the price of having to put your personal pride to the side. You know, it's not easy for everybody to have conversations with people about the gospel. Sometimes it's uh, because we're shy. Sometimes it's not easy. It doesn't come natural to everybody to just start talking about Jesus and bring Jesus into the lives of the people around you. And very often, at the very least, we have to take our own personal pride and set it to the side. We're going to probably have to come out of our comfort zone to a certain degree to bring Jesus into the lives of the people around us. And if you've ever been involved in bringing Jesus Christ into the world, you know what I'm talking about. I know that pastors deal almost constantly with the cost and the effort and the value of everything they do to bring Jesus Christ into the world and always calculate, is what we're doing worth it? And a lot of churches around us today have decided they've done all the calculating. They've been in a similar situation to Joseph. They've seen what it's going to cost. They've seen what the result is possibly going to be, and they've decided that it's not worth it. Many pastors have left the ministry because they've decided that bringing Jesus Christ into the world is not worth it. Many churches have closed their doors because they've come to the conclusion that bringing Jesus Christ into the world is not worth the cost of having a church doors open and spending time on a Sunday or throughout the week or any other day of the week for that matter to bring Jesus Christ into the world. Many churches are doing a lot less today than they've ever done before. I recently spoke with an evangelist who spoke to me about the great difficulty he has in scheduling evangelistic meetings because pastors tell him that they're concerned that they, if they have a meeting, nobody's going to come to it. Sure, we want to bring Jesus into the world, but probably wouldn't succeed. Probably wouldn't be worth the effort that we would go through. It might not be worth what we would spend financially to bring Jesus Christ into the world. And many churches today are doing less to bring Jesus into the world than they've ever done before. When I believe, personally, we're at a time in history when we probably should be doing more to bring Jesus into the world than we've ever done before. I personally believe that churches should not be cutting back right now, but doing more to bring Jesus Christ into the world. But doing more comes at a price. It's not easy. And I'm not telling you that it is easy. In fact, what we're preaching here right now is that doing more is difficult. We're going to have to do more. We're going to have to put aside our pride. We're going to have to dig a little deeper to do more. And there's nothing pretty about it. Joseph was in a very shameful situation here. It was not anything that any normal man would go forward with. And Joseph himself was calculating just exactly how he should go about this and whether or not he should even go forward 
with the situation. And we today find ourselves in the same situation, having a responsibility, I believe, to bring Jesus Christ into the world. But everything you do, every step you take to bring Jesus Christ into the world comes at a cost. It comes at uh, a certain amount of calculated pride that we have to set to the side to do it. Nobody has ever given themselves to bringing Jesus into the world because it was an easy thing to do or because it was the cool thing to do or because it was the thing that if you gave yourself to that, everybody's going to love you and you're just going to have the best life ever because you brought Jesus into the world. That's never been part of the equation for anybody at any point in the past 2,000 years. It certainly wasn't that way for Joseph. And I believe that you all understand that. If you've done anything to bring Jesus Christ into the world, you know that it comes with sacrifice. It comes at a certain cost. But I want to give us two reasons this morning that I hope will encourage us to go forward with bringing Jesus Christ into the world. It says in verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. What was going on in the life of Joseph and Mary at this point was none of their doing. It wasn't Joseph's plan. It wasn't his idea. It wasn't Mary's plan. It wasn't her idea. What was going on in Mary was of God, was of the Holy Ghost. That was God's plan. And the way it went down, the way it happened, was God's plan. It was all God's plan. And here the angel is encouraging Joseph to move forward because what's going on is God's plan. And I want to encourage us today that... The idea of bringing Jesus Christ into the world, whether it be you as an individual or the work of this church collectively, is of God. God established this church for the purpose of bringing Jesus Christ into the world. It's God's plan. God gives you your life as an individual Christian for the purpose of bringing Jesus Christ into the world. The Apostle Paul came to the conclusion in Philippians chapter 1, he said, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. See, the Apostle Paul didn't want to be here. He didn't want to be on the, in this world. He said it would be far better to die and be with Jesus Christ, but, he said, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Apostle Paul understood that God had put him on this earth as a Christian to bring Jesus Christ into the lives of other people. That was his one purpose for living. It was needful for others that he abide in the flesh, and the same is true for us today. God has given you your life as an individual that you might bring Jesus Christ into the lives of other people. That's God's plan for this church. That's God's plan for you. And no matter what it might cost us, no matter how uncomfortable it might be, no matter how much pride we have to put to the side, we can give ourselves to bringing Jesus Christ into the world because that's God's plan. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. It's not easy. Every calculated effort to bring Jesus Christ into the world means leaving something comfortable behind. It means giving up something. I can tell you that I didn't go to Italy because that's what I wanted to do. And I was never against it. I never fought with God over it when he led me to go to Italy. But I grew up in Nallen, West Virginia, just a little bit north of here. It's a wonderful place, about 50 people there. I would have stayed there my entire life. That's where I would have been comfortable. I didn't want to go to Italy. I didn't want to go learn a new language. But I didn't do it because that was my plan. It wasn't my idea. It was God's plan. And that's why we did it. You know, I look at a building like this, and it's a beautiful place. And uh, maintaining a place like this and having a place like this comes at a certain cost. You know, somebody, I don't know when this church was started, but somebody along the line years ago got this idea that to bring Jesus Christ into the world, we needed a beautiful place like this where we could meet and we could talk about doing it and we could plan it and we could get together and do it. And they paid a lot of money to make it happen. And they went through a lot of effort to make it happen, to bring Jesus Christ into the world. It always costs something. Everybody who's here today, to a certain degree, we're not directly bringing Jesus Christ into the lives of the world today, but we're bringing, by being here today, bringing Jesus Christ into our lives. We're bringing Jesus Christ into the lives of our children just by coming here today, and that comes at a certain cost. There are a lot of people today who said, I have better things to do. They calculated it all. They calculated that where they could stay in bed, they could go to church, they could go out with their friends and family and play and have fun, or they could come to church. And a lot of them decided that they weren't going to come to church because bringing Jesus Christ into the world 
wasn't worth the cost of going and attending a church service where we're going to talk about bringing Jesus Christ into the world. But we're not here because it's my plan. Jesus Christ is the one who said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It's God's plan that we bring Jesus Christ into the world, and that's why we do it, and that's why the cost doesn't matter, because it's not a man's plan. I didn't come up with this. Pastor Setzer didn't come up with this. God came up with what we're doing here today. God came up with the idea, bring Jesus Christ into the world. That's God's plan, and that's why we do it. And that's why Joseph went forward, because he understood that it was what was going on in Mary wasn't her fault. It wasn't anything wrong she did. It wasn't anything wrong he had done. That was God's plan, and he was encouraged to go forward. Verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this is the second thing I want to encourage you about in bringing Jesus Christ into the world no matter what the cost. Bringing Jesus into the world, into the hearts of the people around you, into the lives of the people around you is God's plan for the salvation of the world. In fact, that's God's plan to resolve all of the world's problems, bringing Jesus Christ into the world. And this is important because today churches all over the world have noticed that preaching Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel is not popular. And it's not the way you draw huge crowds, and it's not the way you make money, and it's not the way you become famous. You become famous, and many of them rich, and many of them popular, by preaching other messages. And there are a lot of fun messages out there to preach. But we preach Jesus Christ, and we've dedicated ourselves to bringing Jesus Christ into the world, because Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. Out of all of the problems in the world, you know, we have political problems. It would be very easy to think that political reform would solve the world's problems, but it won't. Jesus Christ will solve the world's problems. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in politics. Sure, we should. You know, there's a lot of economic problems in the world, but economic reform is not the answer to the world's problems. Some churches think it is, and some churches preach that it is. And I'm not against helping people financially. That's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, to a certain degree, that's part of what we do on occasion is help people economically and wonderful. But we preach Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And that's why churches like yours and ministries like ours are dedicated to bringing Jesus Christ into the world because that is the way of salvation. There's a lot of education problems in the world. There's a lot of ignorance in the world. But education is not the key to the world's problems. Jesus Christ is the key to the world's problems, and that's why we've dedicated ourselves to preaching Jesus Christ and bringing Jesus Christ into the lives of people because that is the way of salvation. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you about this this morning. Bring Jesus into the world no matter what the cost because that's where salvation for the world lies is by bringing Jesus Christ into the hearts and lives of your own children, of your neighbors, and into all the world as Jesus Christ commanded us to do. Now, I hope that you are thinking about bringing Jesus into the world. I hope these are things that you've already attempted to do. If you've done so, you know that it comes at a certain cost. You've already done some of the calculation. Some of you possibly today have done the calculation of what it costs to bring Jesus Christ into the world to you personally, and you've decided, you know what, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to participate at a bare minimum because I'm not willing to pay the cost. And I want to encourage you, get busy bringing Jesus Christ into the world because that's God's plan for you. If you're not bringing Jesus Christ into the world, you're not fulfilling God's plan for you on this earth. If this church isn't preaching Jesus Christ and bringing Jesus Christ into the lives of people all over the place, you're not doing what God puts you here to do. And I want to encourage you to do that. You want to solve the world's problems? You want to have true influence in the world? Preach Jesus Christ because that's how you'll change the world. That's how you'll solve the world's problems because that's God's plan to resolve the world's problems is the preaching of the gospel message, the preaching of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only name that we have salvation in. And I want to encourage you in this today. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in a difficult situation, preaching the gospel often to our own family members. Have you ever been at a spot where you could give the gospel to your own children or to a relative, a close relative of yours that knew you very well, 
and you realize as you're about to do it, you really can't do it because your behavior around that person hasn't been such that you could even preach the gospel to that person. You know, some of us need to change our behavior. That's the price we have to pay to be able to preach the gospel to the people around us. Some of us aren't living a lifestyle that would even allow us to preach the gospel to somebody. You know, sometimes we have to just be willing to pay the cost, whether it be personal pride, a change in lifestyle, maybe a financial cost. It always comes at a price. Joseph paid a big price. As far as I know, uh, historically, they teach us that because you don't get much information about Joseph from the time Jesus is 12 on, a lot of people believe that Joseph died before Jesus started his ministry. And if that's so, Joseph, in the entire time from his life from this point on, probably was never known by the people around him as the man who helped bring the Messiah into the world because people didn't know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. There's a real good chance that the people around Joseph and Mary did not know in Jesus' early years that Jesus was the Son of God. I think Joseph and Mary probably didn't fully understand that concept at times until the resurrection. Joseph probably lived his whole life bearing a certain amount of shame because of the role he played in bringing Jesus Christ into the world. We could have preached this sermon from the book of Romans where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We go forward with preaching Jesus no matter the shame, no matter the cost, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Now this sermon this morning is for Christians, but I do want to say this. Some people here this morning probably didn't really catch this message as being for themselves because maybe you haven't even brought Jesus Christ into your own life, much less gotten busy bringing Jesus into the lives of other people. And we could preach this sermon from the same point of view, and that is this. If you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Savior, bringing Jesus Christ into your own life, you've probably made the calculation that too many things are going to have to change for you if you decide to accept Christ as your Savior. There might be things in your life you have to give up if you bring Jesus Christ into your own life. You might have to set aside your own pride to bring Jesus Christ into your own life as your Savior. But let me tell you this, bringing Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior, confessing your sins, repenting, and asking Jesus Christ to save you is God's plan for you. It's God's plan for the salvation of your soul, and you won't find salvation in any other name. And I want to encourage you today to bring Jesus Christ into your own life because it's God's plan for you for the salvation of your soul. And as a church, I want to encourage you today to dedicate yourselves to bringing Jesus Christ into the hearts and lives of people around you because that's God's plan for you to bring salvation to the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for your word. The work that you've given us to do is honorable work and it is great work. And I believe that one day churches like this one will indeed be reaping eternal benefits because of the work we've done to get Jesus into the world. But we know that right now it's not always like that. It doesn't always seem honorable. And it doesn't always seem majestic and glorious, which it really is. But right here and right now, it's often accompanied by shame and always, at the very least, by a certain cost and a certain amount of discomfort. I pray, Father, that you'd give us the grace and give us your strength, Father, your miraculous grace to do the job you've given us to do. It's your work, and it's the answer to all the world's problems, bringing Jesus Christ into the hearts and lives of people around us. Father, help us with it, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.